All right, I think we'll go ahead and, and we'll uh, get started. Welcome, everyone. We're so happy that you could join us this morning. My name is Lynn schmidt McQuitty, and I am the Strategic Initiative Leader for Healthy Families and Communities. And along with my colleague, Dr. Deanne Meyer, who is the Strategic Initiative Leader for Sustainable Food Systems, we're very pleased to be able to bring this webinar series together for you all. We've got a very exciting panel today and we're very much looking forward to the information and participation. Our presenters this morning are Dr. Aaron DiCaprio, whose area of expertise is in microbiology, or excuse me, is in microbial food safety with an emphasis on foodborne viruses. And Dr. Elda Pires, whose research foci is on qualitative methods to identify strategies that improve animal health and control infectious diseases in livestock on small scale farms. We think that their expertise and their knowledge in this area is going to help us and uh, provide us with some insight as well as opportunities for great conversation and also we hope additional collaborations and, and opportunities for new research and programs. So Erin, you're up first. Why don't you go ahead and take it away? So very happy to be here. Um, so just a little bit of background. I am the Cooperative Extension Specialist in Community Food Safety. I'm housed in the Food Science and Technology Department at uh, UC Davis. And I actually study foodborne viruses in my laboratory. So I've fielded a lot of questions from different stakeholder groups, from consumers, growers, uh, food processors over the last several months. And so today I really wanted to highlight um, some of the resources that, that I've worked to develop, but also point you to resources developed by other groups that can help to provide accurate information to these different stakeholder groups on, on you know, how they might address different food safety questions or concerns that have come about because of this pandemic. Uh, I just wanted to start with this quick first polling question uh, for the group. So did COVID-19 originate from someone eating exotic meat? Um, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to respond to this one. Good, good, good. Everybody knows how to use the polling feature. Another couple of seconds, about half the folks have voted. All right, so let's go ahead and close that poll. And it looks like over half of the respondents um, did say that no, this virus did not originate from someone eating exotic meat. Um, so that uh, is definitely the, the messaging that we've been um, trying to convey uh, through uh, extension during this pandemic. So I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview on coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2. So coronaviruses represent a really important group of zoonotic viruses. So these are viruses that originate in an animal species and then through a series of mutations gain the ability to infect humans. Um, so there are three of the, so here on this slide, I'm showing all the coronaviruses that cause disease in humans. And there are three um, pictured here that cause severe respiratory illness in humans. So the first is the original SARS virus, um, SARS coronavirus. Um, another is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome uh, coronavirus or MERS coronavirus. And then of course we have SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. And so you'll see for all three of these, virus, these viruses, um, they originated in bats. And then what we see for many of these viruses is that they require an intermediate animal host between that original species and humans to allow the virus to further uh, adapt to be able to infect humans. So for the, the original SARS virus, that intermediate home, a host was a palm civet cat. And these animals are routinely housed, slaughtered, and then sold at what are called wet markets in China. And so for the original SARS virus that emerged in 2003, it's been confirmed that these wet markets were the original site for this crossover of SARS virus from animals to humans. 
for the SARS coronavirus 2, SARS CoV 2, that causes COVID 19. Um, we currently don't know what this intermediate host animal would be, um, but initial uh, cases uh, for this virus emerged in a wet market in China. Um, however, there have been more recent reports um, indicating that the virus might have been circulating in China prior to those cases that were associated with visiting um, this wet market. Um, so that's still in question. Also, we don't know the intermediate hosts for this particular virus yet. There have been um, some reports that pangolins, which are an endangered species that are highly trafficked, in China because of their use in traditional medicine. Um, they've been proposed to be an intermediate host, but no conclusive evidence to date that that, that is the case. Um, what I want to emphasize here that it's not consumption of these animal products that leads to the disease, but being in close proximity to these animals and their droplets that lead to transmission to humans. So that's why these wet markets are kind of a hotbed for these um, jumps from animals to humans because these animals are housed live at these markets and people are being exposed to their droplets. And so we do see, um, you know, at least for SARS-CoV-1 that this particular virus emerged at these wet markets, um, but perhaps not for SARS-CoV-2. So kind of to follow up on that question, um, is COVID-19 transmitted by food or food packaging? Yes or no? So I'm asking this question because this is really the first thing um, that, that came into my inbox and my, my telephone when this pandemic emerged. So it looks like about half have responded. All right, let's go ahead and just close this poll. And so happy to see um, that most people responded that no, this virus is not um, transmitted by food or food packaging. And that is um, most definitely the, the messaging that we're giving at this point in time. FDA, USDA, the CDC, WHO have all put out statements that there's currently no evidence of transmission of this virus via food or food packaging. SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus and data suggests it only remains infectious for a few days at most outside of the human body. Um, all of the foodborne pathogens that we worry about can be stable for really long periods outside of the body and remain stable in food for long um, periods of time. And so that's a major difference between foodborne pathogens and SARS-CoV-2. Also, the transmission mode for this virus is via respiratory droplet. So this means that the virus has to get into your respiratory tract to cause disease. This is primarily achieved by being in close proximity to someone that uh, has an active COVID infection and is you know, coughing, sneezing, maybe even talking um, and, and shedding virus in their uh, respiratory droplets. Foodborne pathogens are all transmitted by the fecal oral roots. So that means you actually have to eat these particular pathogens to get sick and they all replicate primarily in your digestive tract. Um, so very different again from SARS-CoV-2. So all of this, um, all of these characteristics of SARS-CoV-2 really, I think help um, make a strong case that this virus is, is not going to be transmitted significantly by food or food packaging. So since this, this, the, this pandemic began, I've received a lot of questions around consumer concerns um, related to COVID-19 and food. So I wanted to share here some of the resources that can support um, consumers and the questions they have around food safety and COVID-19. So another question uh, for the group, um, since the pandemic started, have you changed any of your food handling procedures at home? Um, so again, yes or no here. This could be things like, um, are you sanitizing food packaging? Are you, you know, using any chemicals for washing your produce? Are you quarantining groceries when you get home from the store? All right, so let's go ahead and close that poll. 
So it looks like a, a pretty even split here. Some folks have changed their, their handling procedures while others have not. Um, and so one of the, the messages we've really been trying to convey, um, because this particular virus is not considered to be a food safety risk, is that consumers follow the same safe food handling procedures that they have um, prior to the pandemic. And this is showing some results from a recent CDC report where they've seen significant increases to calls to poison control centers since the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 in the US because people are misusing cleaners or disinfectants. Um, in this particular report, there was also a case study where an individual had mixed bleach, vinegar, and hot water in their sink to wash their produce, which resulted in the formation of chlorine gas and this person having to go to the ER for treatment. Um, so unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there on the web um, for how you should be handling foods at home. Things like, uh, you know, hand soap, dish soap, bleach, a lot of other, you know, disinfectants. Those aren't labeled for food use and we don't recommend people use them to try and disinfect um, foods when they get home. And unfortunately, some of these practices are in themselves food safety risks. Um, so I'm hoping I can point you to some resources that, that can be a tool um, to help get that, that information out to the public on, on you know, how we should be handling foods and um, how can we ensure food safety during the pandemic. So this is just a list of some of the questions that have come in over the past few months. Certainly not an exhaustive list but kind of due to being inundated with a lot of these questions, I, along with Dr. Linda Harris, um, have built out a subpage on our UC Food Safety website. You can see the URL here um, with different resources for different stakeholder groups. So we have a lot of resources here for consumers as well as food processors, growers, also people that are working in grocery stores, restaurants, and then also some resources specifically targeted to extension educators and resources. Um, so if you've received any of these questions and are looking for guidance on how to address them or how to provide people with accurate information, please visit this website. I think we probably have something that can address um, most of those um, questions. I just want to highlight a couple of things here. So there are lots of print materials on that website. Um, so kind of early on in the pandemic, Dr. Harris and myself, as well as food safety extension colleagues across the country, worked to develop a series of fact sheets related to COVID-19 and food safety. So I'm just showing one here. Um, so these were created initially by colleagues at NC State um, and then were rebranded uh, for UC ANR. So there's many resources um, in English and also in Spanish that are um, branded for UC ANR as well as um, a myriad of other fact sheets that have been developed by, by other um, extension specialists that you can find on our website. I've also had the opportunity to do a lot of media interviews and I'm just highlighting a few of them here. Um, so all of these materials are linked on our website. And so um, I encourage you to, to seek those out um, because I, I have found them really useful in helping consumers as well as some of those other stakeholder groups that I mentioned. We've also um, done some other webinars and I've recorded some short kind of snippet presentations um, that I think could be you know, useful for this group. So um, I'm highlighting those here. So the, the videos that I've recorded are kind of a brief overview of you know, different characteristics of the virus, you know, what is a virus, just to help broaden understanding I've also done some kind of longer webinars if you're interested in sitting and listening for an hour. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I did a webinar for the Northern California Division of the Institute of Food Technologists that gives a bit more detail about the virus detection methods, vaccine development and therapeutics, and how the food industry can help um, mitigate worker um, health risks during the pandemic. 
So in addition to providing resources for consumers, I've also done a lot of work to help provide um, resources for home preservers and food entrepreneurs. So I'll just highlight a couple of those here. Um, so early on in the pandemic, um, I had scheduled several food safety trainings with um, um, different county master food preserver programs. I serve as the technical food safety advisor for that statewide program. And we realized we weren't gonna be able to keep the trainees attention for two hours of me talking about food safety and preservation. And what we opted to do was record a series of short videos of different aspects of food preservation as well as food safety. Um, so these were geared towards our master food preserver trainees, but they're publicly available. So if you don't happen to have a master food preserver program in your county, or if you have personal interest or stakeholders that have been asking questions about food preservation, these can be found on our training subpage on the UC Food Safety website. Um, and under this UC Master Food Preserver training. Um, I would also like to give a big plug for the Master Food Preserver program. They've done a tremendous job of gathering resources during the pandemic. So different videos on home um, preservation, other resources. So do look at their website as well for additional um, information and tools uh, related to home, safe home food preservation. And then I think one of the things um, that, you know, all of us that, that work in food systems have experienced are just these tremendous disruptions to the supply chain. And uh, one of the things that I've done since I started here um, at UCANR is really try to provide support for food entrepreneurs and smaller scale food processors in relation to food safety, regulatory compliance, um, also some product development to help them be successful in starting the food business. So here I'm showing a, a flow chart that I developed with a collaborator at Community Alliance for Family Farmers to help growers that were interested in producing value added products understand the different regulatory um, issues that, that may exist for different types of products. So as you can see, it's, it's not straightforward, it's a little complicated. So if you're working with stakeholders that are interested, you know, in, in starting a food business, um, please check out again the resources on the website, but feel free to refer those people to me. I'm happy to work with them um, through these different uh, issues. So with that, I wanted to just segue into another polling question, and, and this is more to, to help broaden my understanding. Do you know of restaurants or farms that have started to, to transition into producing value-added products like jams, jellies, baked goods, or sauces as disruption to, due to disruptions to the supply chain or reduced patronage due to COVID-19? So we'll leave this open for just um, a minute. All right, we can go ahead and close it. So it does look like there's a, you know, a good number of you that know people are transitioning. Um, so I would encourage you again to, to reach out to, to me if, you know, some of these groups need support. And then one last polling question um, as we transition to um, Dr. Pierce's presentation. Um, do you work with any growers that have uh, started to transition to growing vegetables or fruits as a result of the pandemic where they were previously maybe growing flowers or grains prior to the pandemic? I asked because I spoke to a grower last week who was a flower farmer who is now growing vegetables to help support their community during the pandemic. Okay, so we could end that poll. So a couple, um, not many, um, but I, I think Dr. Pierce will talk about um, some resources out there for growers um, and that would have be applicable to uh, gardeners as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Olga. Thank you, Erin. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Alda and I'm a food safety specialist at uh, UC Davis in or specialist in urban ag and food safety 
and most of my work has been on pre-harvest food safety working with small scale farms and farms uh, with integration of um, integration of oops something okay let's go uh, integration of um, and livestock and vegetables so uh, for today talk I have um, just um, share with you some of the resources on farm the related food safety and resources uh, uh, to guidelines related to prevention of COVID-19, mostly on workers' health and hygiene. Um, so starting with, with the question, um, to have an idea of our audience, what is the biggest um, impact uh, on farming you have seen with COVID-19 on related to food safety, workers' health, distribution, or food security, or does not apply if you don't work with farmers? So just, um, most 50% has respond. So I think we can close the poll. Um, so mostly of, um, more than 50% seems doesn't work with farmers, but the others, it seems that's worker health and safety is what the major concern. And I will have a few resources to share with you in the next slides. So as Dr. DiCapri mentioned, COVID-19 is not a food safety concern and uh, on farm. And if the farms are implementing good agricultural practice, and here I'm focused on fresh produce of so vegetables and fruits that are under FISMA. FISMA is the Food Safety Modernization Act, produce safety rules. So it's a standards, um, it's a regulation for standards on production, harvesting, handling of vegetables and fruits that normally are eaten raw. And uh, there was a major change in regulation food safety where most of the farms that are producing those vegetables under this rule, uh, they will have to follow these standards and guidelines. So, and help those farmers to be in compliance with the regulations, uh, the, produce, the Produce Safety Alliance, so it's organization based in Cornell, is provide a standardized curriculum where the farm that's under this, this rule will need to have a person uh, that went through this training, so the standardized training, and will help to implement those standards. And the compliance or the will depending uh, on the size of the farm and so on. Um, so a change with, with COVID-19 was that this training normal will need to will have to be in person so people will sit one day one day and a half and we'll have this uh this training uh on um most of the the topics will be biological soil amendments so manure compost and so on uh, uh intrusion of wildlife um animals agriculture water and standards for irrigation and post harvest and equipment and uh, sanitation final, and final workers' health and hygiene and training. So this is standardized uh, training that because we cannot meet in person, they open an exception and now they, they've been allowed to be done remotely. So uh, some of this training is done remotely by Zoom and also there is a, a possibility to get the training online and this still on until until we change uh, kind of the scenario of COVID-19. The Western Institute for Food Safety and Security hosts two of those, two of those trainings back in May and, and is plan, planned, um, planning to, to host another trainings, remotely trainings. So in addition to that, some of, of us has work with the uh, um, complementary material. So this is, that is the standardized curriculum but then there's a complementary training on materials that, um, as an example here, that was um, done in collaboration uh, with the Western, Cent Western Institute for Food Safety and Security, where Erin de Capra and myself, we, uh, we work with them and develop online modules in different areas. And it's a very visual uh, um, materials with different videos and actually can you use in your training uh, with your clientele and here is the link. So this is, these modules does not replace the standardized but does complement and offer videos and visual aids for, for that training. 
Um, so, and then, then another resource that we been um, organized or, or summarized, and, and here I'm sharing some of those. And as, as Dr. Erin Caprio uh, mentioned, the UC Food Safety does have um, um, compiled different resources for he folks on farms, growers, and workers. And one of the things is um, there is such a different agriculture uh, production systems um, uh, across California and the United States that to, to implement different guidelines either on food safety or COVID-19 prevention of transmission will take some adjustments. So there we can find resources for community gardens, uh, producers and growers in general, you pick up farms and workers in California. Also I'd like to mention the resource for specific agritourism and urban agriculture, particular agritourism, there was a the challenge to keep that in operations and the, the uh, SAREP has the California Agritourism webpage and have different resources. And I will just point out one, it's uh, developed by Initial by Hood in Fresno uh, on roadside stands. They have different signs they, for local produce, strawberries and so on. And, um, and also uh, Jennifer Sowine in Berkeley, she has a series of materials, PowerPoints and checklists for specific for urban agriculture and non-commercial settings uh, uh, pr producing fresh produce. And finally, we have the UCNR coronavirus and COVID-19, where they found different resources more general on agriculture, food and water, youth development, and so on. So there's just all great resource and you can find all um, in one place or a few places, depending on the needs of the different uh, growers or, or, or clientele. So uh, like the, the second question, is COVID-19 a concern for livestock? Yes or no? So we have. So um, most of us, as I said, no, and actually, just close these. So actually, there is no evidence that domestic animals, including livestock, uh, play a significant uh, role in spreading SARS-CoV-2 uh, to, to people. Uh, as you may recall from news, there is a few cases across the world, either with domestic animals or pets, dogs and, and cats, or captive animals, or the outbreak that was with uh, farm wild animals, that was the mink. But in general, so all the, the health organizations, the CDC, the World uh, Health Organization, and AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, agree there is no evidence to suggest pets spread, spread COVID-19 to people. Although animal owners, pets, or livestock should continue to practice good hygiene during interactions with animals, that includes washing hands before and after handling pets, animal food, and waste and supplies. So I have here a few of uh, the reference for AVMA, it's more for veterinarians, but they have these nice small uh, PDFs or PowerPoint uh, different um, tools that can be applied in, in, in for those that needs training uh, involving livestock or, or, or pets. And, and and part of, of we have seen initial COVID-19 and we still that's the impacts on, on the food systems has been more on distribution and food supply. And here I'm just sharing uh, a, a map. So there is an independent um, organization. They pull together uh, the different uh, outbreaks at three different areas as farms and ranches, food processing plants and meat pack plants. And, um, this just to give an idea of uh, the different outbreaks across the food systems. Uh, as the, this website, they use data from official health departments and as well news. So they try to cross and as, as yesterday or today, they, they report about 416 outbreaks and in the food processing plants and meat packing plants and about 64 in, in, um, in farmers and, and ranches. And that's, it's still changing. 
Um, so if we, we know we have, we'll have a, a webinar specific on beef supply chain and market disruptions that I invite you to, to attend. Uh, they'll be on August 20th, 25th, uh, talking about the food supply and, 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 and disruptions on, on food systems. And also I'd like to share a fact sheet. So another area that was affected with COVID-19 was 4-H and FFA, so the youth that with the uh, uh, livestock with the cancellation of county fairs and, and junior livestock auctions were affected. And Morgan, Tracy, and Laura, they developed this fact sheet on market animal sale options and regulations and uh, for those working with, with 4-H. Um, so most of the pool initial, we, we was uh, most of the, the ones that work with workers or uh, uh, farmers, they, they mentioned that uh, the most concern that they have been approached is relating to worker health and safety and how we are adapting to this new reality. And I just pull out these two pictures from news and one is how farmers workers, this is actually in Salinas, um, they have uh, implemented different measures as barriers between workers, masks and so on. And that's the, the next slides that I will share um, oh, just before that uh, pull question. Have you been contacted by agricultural operations or associate industry with questions regarding worker health, safety, and COVID-19? So uh, it seems that uh, most of the people that answer this sort of way has not been contact uh, with questions regarding workers' health and safety. Um, So, although I will share some, some of different, um, as some of the related uh, in extension that are working with different um, um, resources and, uh, and, uh, and uh, guidelines for workers' health and safety. And, and implement, I think one of the challenge and special, in my case, I work with a very diversified uh, types of agriculture systems with integration of animals and vegetables and so on and very different as we go across the California and start to think how, how to implement these guidelines as based on different commodities and systems and, and, and so on. So one of the resources I would like to share is from the Western Center for Agriculture, Health and, and Safety. They have different fact sheets and um, um, different fact sheets, checklists and so on, as well as videos in English and Spanish uh, helping on, on training and um, implement those guidelines regarding the social distancing, ma uh, ma use of masks and, and, and early detection of sick people and so on. And last week CDFA just released two nice flyers. Um, on One is on COVID-19 awareness for agriculture based on three principles, how to prevent, educate and respond. I, I like these flyers because they are easily accessed to different organizations by the QR codes. Uh, to CDFA, CDPH, and CDC, and the Western Center for Agriculture, Health, and Safety. And also, they have another flyer, how tips how to educating farmer workers on COVID-19, and some of those tips are based in another training that have been, uh, has been proved that works with, with farm workers. And you might be aware as well that CDC uh, released a few weeks ago uh, guidance for agricultural workers and employers and a checklist. And um, that's another resource for uh, um, guidance for agriculture and workers in, in these settings. And with that, that's just my, that was my presentation. And I believe we have Danae Meyer next to with some of the transition question, questions. And thank you for uh, attending this short talk. Oops, should I stop sharing? So well, we can um, go to some of the questions that were in the Q&A. Okay. Um, a couple of questions have popped up and if people have questions for either of our um, guest speakers, please put them in the Q&A at this point. Um, 
and then we'll work on them. We're going to use the chat box for group discussion in a little bit. But um, there are two questions that are in the Q&A at this point. And the first question was early on, Aaron, uh, could you please define the droplets from the animal as a host? Sure, so that would be, you know, similar uh, to the droplets we see in humans. So it could be, you know, respiratory droplets. It might also be possible that these animals could be shedding virus in urine or feces. So that would be another type of droplet. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there's evidence, but certainly, you know, blood would also be a concern. Um, but essentially these droplets would need to gain access to your mucous membranes and, and get into your respiratory tract to cause disease. Um, so the issue, you know, with these wet markets is that there are live animals housed there, um, you know, in very close proximity to each other. Um, my understanding is that oftentimes the, these animals are housed under stressful conditions, which, you know, may uh, increase their level of, of virus shedding uh, via those droplets. Um, so it's, you know, it, I think it's it's known that these are, are certainly a concern for the emergence of coronavirus. So we've seen the original SARS and now potentially SARS-CoV-2 uh, emerge at these markets, but you know, for other types of zoonotic pathogens as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Alda, you have anything to add to that, but I, I hope that answers your question. I just have to add, I, I, I didn't mention in my slide that um, the cases that are seen in domestic animals or pets in the United States and, and across the globe are animals they were living with people that was actually infected and, and sick. Um, so it's about 20 cases in pets across the globe and, uh, and, and all of them has been, um, they living very close to, to animals um, is is it they you know they were sick and it seems the source of infection um yeah that that's and and the, and the the guidelines avma is today is not to testing normally the pests or, or domestic animals at, you know as as a routine thank you so the um Next question is, uh, if you know the current status of the wet market. Oh, this is a good question. I, I think there's definitely been a push, um, you know, from our government, but also the WHO to, to close down um, many of these wet markets in China. I, I do believe as a, you know, a result of the emergence in that particular fish market in Wuhan, they, they did shut down that market for a while. My understanding that is now um, that market is back open in a more limited capacity. Um, I believe that, you know, China has tried to curtail the trafficking of wild animals in those wet markets. Um, but I don't believe they have, have fully closed those markets at, at this point. Um, I don't know if Alda, you have any um, additional information on the wet market. I, I do not, Erin. Okay, so we're, we're working our way through. We have some poll questions while we're asking, um, trying to get your, your questions answered. So we'd like to encourage you also to um, put your questions in the Q&A. Um, the next question we have is uh, one about the Ag Worker Flyers. Is that available in Spanish? Um, so the CDFA, the two flyers I present, I'm not sure. I will have to check the CDFA and I will provide the link uh, to other resources. Um, 
the the flyers part of the flyers and the resources they are in um, uh, with Western Work Health Center. The, most of them they are in Spanish. Um, and uh, if you are interested in different commodities, I know another resources as dairy, for example, there's another universities they have also in Spanish. If I'm interested, I, I can pull that together. Thank you for the question. So if we can do the next poll question, that would be great. Thank you. We have quite a few folks chiming in. We're just checking to see if we hit our target with today's webinar in hopes that uh, we provide some useful information for people to use in their job. And um, that looks like a definitely a, a mark hit. So we thank our presenters uh, for sure for that. Um, we'll have the next question we have. It seems that transportation from home to farm is one of the most challenging points of construction for farm workers where social distancing is often impossible. Do either of you know of growers or contra labor contractors or any other groups that are providing additional transportation options uh, in order to alleviate that close nature? Well, I think it's certainly uh, a concern. Um, I had just seen a story, I, I don't know if it's the first confirmed um, outbreak, but there was a group of um, farm workers that were in group housing that have come down with COVID. So certainly, you know, group housing situations, transportation are a, a major concern. Um, so, I don't know, you know, personally of the, the, the types of efforts that, you know, might be going on to address those issues. Um, Cornell has done, I think, a really great job um, through the Produce Safety Alliance of trying to provide guidance for growers on how to address those issues, but whether or not that's being implemented, um, I, I can't say. Um, so there's there's certainly resources out there for how to try to, to address crowding in vehicles or in, in group housing. You know, I, I don't know if that's being implemented or not. Perhaps individuals might provide some input who yeah. are participating and write some answers in the chat box. If anybody who's joined on the webinar today is aware of anything that's happening, if you'd use the chat box to provide that information, we can at least co collect it and share it out with the group. Um, if we could have our next poll question. And while that's coming up, Alda, if you wanted to add to the so I talking with other colleagues at extension specialists, I, I know some commodities, they have switched kind of the traditional will provide the housing and, and you know, that's changing not provide the housing and, and let that's the farm workers, you know, find that home housing. So there's some, some switch there. Um, as say Aaron, uh, how much that has been implemented and changed. Um, yeah, I'll be interested to hear the experience with, with the audience and they share. Thank you. So it looks like the electronic resources were helpful for folks. Um, we did try to put them in the chat box for those who were near a computer and able to catch them uh, and capture them and use them later. And alternatively, if you missed that part, certainly uh, there'll be the opportunity to have it in the, um, the recording of the webinar afterwards for folks. Um, we do have another question, if we can go on to our next question. So, um, thank you. We'll, we'll have the polling question up while we ask the question from the group. Uh, Laureen Lewis is asking, please talk more about how safe it is when grocery shopping. How clean are the packages of food with the virus potentially living around them? 
Yeah, so I, I'll address this one. This is um, something that has come up a lot. Um, and from, you know, my perspective, knowing what I know about the transmission of this virus, uh, my concern grocery shopping is not the virus being on food or food packaging. It's being in close proximity to other people that are in that grocery store, whether or not it's other shoppers or, you know, the, the essential workers that are there, you know, the greatest risk is, is really being around other people. And I think that's become clear as we see businesses opening up and really these pockets of uh, increased disease where, you know, people are gathering and large groups, they might not be wearing masks. So from my perspective, biggest concern is, is physically being in close proximity to people. Um, kind of, you know, next on that list when I'm trying to make risk management decisions is looking at high touch points. So, you know, if you can imagine a door handle that everyone has to touch when they're going into a store, there are going to be, you know, numerous contacts from various people on that particular surface. So that high touch surface could potentially, um, you know, have infectious virus there if someone that had an infection wiped their nose and then touched the door handle. Just because of the high number of touches on that surface, it's a little bit higher risk. Um, but there has been a lot of guidance coming out that, you know, maybe this risk of surface transmission um, is a lot lower than we initially thought. But when we talk about foods, those aren't what I would consider high touch point surfaces. So really, I think the likelihood that a food item or a food package would be contaminated is really low. So, you know, if you think about produce, for example, if you have a bin of apples, you know, one or two people might pick up the same apple before someone purchased it. It's not going to be, you know, hundreds of people contacting that apple. So the risk would be relatively low. Same sort of deal with packaged foods. You know, if it's a can of soup, maybe the stock boy touched it when they put it on the shelf, but there's probably not a high volume of people going and picking up that can of soup before you take it home. Um, so really, I think it's a, it's a low risk scenario with infectious virus being on food. And the best thing you can do is just after you handle the food, um, wash your hands. So certainly wash your hands when you get home from the store, but then maybe, you know, even after you put things away, just make sure you're rewashing your hands. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of risk management, that's really not something that's high on the level of concern. Thank you. Um, if we could go to our next poll question, that would be great. Um, we would like to transition to a component of the webinar where um, we want to do a little brainstorming with everybody online. And the thought is we'll leave a slide up here for a couple of minutes, uh, maybe a minute, minute and a half with a, a question on it. And if you'd like to put your responses in the chat box, uh, we would appreciate it. In the meantime, I do have another question for you, Erin. Um, should we spend time wiping down grocery items or washing produce? Another good question. Um, so we always wanna wash produce, um, regardless if it's a pandemic or not. Um, and so, the methodology is really simple. Uh, we recommend washing produce under clean running water and then drying that produce on a clean towel. Um, I've gotten several questions about, you know, different produce washes. Should I use soap? Should I use bleach? You don't need to do any of that. Um, as I mentioned, those products with the exception of the, the produce washes that you can buy in a store. They're not labeled for use on foods. We, you know, we don't know if they're safe to consume or if they would even work um, to, to do anything with microorganisms that might be there. 
produce washes I receive questions about. I don't recommend them because there's actually been work done um, in my department showing they don't provide any higher level of microbial removal than just washing with water. So it's, to me, it's kind of throwing money away um, buying those products. Um, as far as wiping down grocery items, um, so it's not something that, that I recommend doing. As I mentioned, again, I think it's really low risk uh, in terms of the virus being present on any of those food packages. Um, if, you know, I, I know we've kind of transitioned to all plastic bags at, at this point, um, but we do have guidance on how to clean and sanitize a reusable shopping bag. So I would recommend um, doing that. If you're in a location that allows for use of those reusable bags, you, you do wanna take care to, to make sure those are cleaned and, and sanitized. And we should be doing that anyway. It's just to limit uh, cross-contamination. Um, but as far as going through the trouble of sanitizing every package of food you bring home, there's, there's no need to do that. Okay, so we're, we have some folks who have um, provided some questions or comments in the chat box related to this particular question. Uh, and hopefully it will actually let me advance it. There we go. Um, the next question then is what research gaps exist related to food system resiliency? And these are questions for all the participants uh, to identify. We're trying to do a little brainstorming here with folks within ANR and with our community partners to identify where you see our roadmap going. Um, this is the beginning of a web series on a resilient food system. And we certainly all knew before, but definitely found out in the middle of March how fragile our food system is. And we're trying to do some brainstorming with people to identify where could we be doing research and what kind of educational materials would be real helpful and useful at this time. So we appreciate folks taking time to put some ideas in the chat box and whether you send them to us as panelists or whether you send them to all attendees and panelists, uh, we appreciate your input. This has uh, been a, an exciting opportunity with Erin and Aldo to learn lots about food safety and big questions that everyone has. Our next question for participants is which community partners might be interested in working on food systems, food system resilience uh, research, education, or solutions? So we know many of you work at the local level and you work with um, many different organizations, uh, whether they're government agencies or whether they're non-government agencies. And we're just curious if there are community partners that might be interested in working on food system resilience research, education, or solutions. And perhaps you're already working with some of those groups now. Diane Metz hit the nail on the head with the food bank. We appreciate that. There are a lot of um, different opportunities with food banks now and California is blessed at having a bountiful harvest and hopefully some markets for it. And when there aren't, then the food banks come in and we're able to save that food and not have to throw all of it away. So that's good. Um, here's another question for you. Might you consider working collaboratively to develop a research project or educational curriculum? Uh, and if that's something you're interested in, then we'd like to help uh, collect the names of people who are interested in doing that and 
get people together so they can work collaboratively to do this. We know there are a lot of people throughout the state doing great work in, in parts of the state. Sometimes we don't realize what's going on in other parts of the state. And this gives us an opportunity to share resources and see what kinds of activities are going on and who might be interested. Uh, and maybe it's an interest you didn't have six months ago and it's a big passion today given all the concerns of these unprecedented times. And then of course, a uh, question that we would love to know is if you're interested in participating in a future webinar, this is the first of a series. We'll hold these on Tuesday, uh, the second and fourth Tuesday at 10 in the morning. Um, our next webinar, I'll pull that up here momentarily. Uh, we do have a slot open in August and I'm real delighted to say we have slots filled through the first uh, session in October. So we're real excited to see people um, participate and identify. Our big objective in all of this is to bring some experts in our organization or outside our organization together and have them provide resources and synopsis of what's going on and what's available so that people can have some resources at their fingertips. Um, it's been wonderful having both Erin and Alda with us today because they're for sure experts in their field, but they also know where all the information is we need to share out so other folks know about it. Um, and if you're interested in participating in a future webinar, um, feel free to just jot down a potential title for us as well. Um, our next webinar is two weeks from today, same location, same time, and you will need to register for that as well. And if I can talk and type, I will stick that in the chat box for folks who are interested in re registering now. Um, Kamal, who is our director of CalFresh, uh, has done an outstanding job at um, collecting some outside experts who will come in and give us a brief presentation to help with all the different resources that are available for people so folks can secure food for families and children. And, you know, it's so important for Californians and it's so important for all of us that we have food and nourishment. So we're excited to see that as our next um, webinar. So with that, we're real grateful to have uh, everyone join us today. We had uh, many, many participants on our webinar. We had over 87 at one point, so that's phenomenal. And we say a huge thank you to Erin and to Alda for your great presentations and look forward to working with others in the future. So folks, stay safe uh, and, you know, enjoy your fruits, your vegetables, and take care of those uh, common contact areas. And as the Everyone tells us, wash your hands, happy birthday to you, 20 seconds every time we go wash them regularly and uh, be safe and stay cool. So thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to the next ANR webinar in two weeks.